Whenever you play a single player game, you're rarely actually alone. There will be enemies you fight against, or there will be allies that you fight alongside. And these characters are called NPCs, non-playable characters, and they are controlled by the game's AI. And without these characters, there just is no game. And it's something that modern players take for granted, something that is expected of any single player experience. But video game AI hasn't always been as complex and high tech as it is in modern games, or at least, as modern and high-tech as it's supposed to be. So let's take a brief history lesson, shall we? Touching on the most interesting and revolutionary examples of video game AI over the last few decades. The first ever examples of AI came about a long time before the first video games did. Games like Chess, Checkers and Nim all had AI that could play the games against human players. The chess AI from the 50s was not very good, not anything like modern day chess computers today. It was far more simple and far worse than even mediocre chess players were. But the AI could at least play the game to a certain degree. But when the first video games ever came out, they were mostly multiplayer games. Games like Pong and Space War, these were the standard of video games gaming in the early 70s, and they didn't feature any non-playable characters at all. AI in games only really became a popular concept upon the release of Space Invaders in 1978. So suddenly, the idea of a single player game with enemies that behaved in predictable yet challenging ways was something that people really wanted out of their games. Galaxian came out a year later in 1979, and it was basically just Space Invaders 2. It had the same premise as Space Invaders, but with far more complex AI. The enemies would sometimes break formation and die bomb the player, and groups would break off and do the same. But in 1980, the game with the most famous example of video game AI was released in the arcades. <laughs> Pac-Man is a simple game. You just move around the maze eating dots while four ghosts chase you. If you eat all the dots, you win. If a ghost touches you, you lose. But unlike games like Space Invaders, which came before it, the AI in Pac-Man was actually surprisingly complicated. Much more complicated than simply marching down the screen until the game ends. The ghosts have three modes, chase, scatter, and frightened. The ghosts enter frightened mode whenever Pac-Man eats one of these big dots. But the other two modes are a lot more hidden. During chase mode, the ghosts will try and chase Pac-Man. During scatter mode, each ghost has a specific tile on the corner of the map that they will run towards, which gives the player a bit of a breather. The ghosts go into chase mode for about 20 seconds, then go into scatter mode for about 7. This is done to make the game not too difficult or stressful for the player. The ghosts make sure to run off and give the player breathing room every now and then for the sake of the game's pacing. But that's not all that's interesting about Pac-Man's AI. Each coloured ghost has unique AI behaviour that makes them chase Pac-Man in a different way. There's four ghosts. You've got Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde. Blinky just chases the player. He just moves to the current location of the player. Pinky is programmed to aim for two tiles in front of the player, meaning that Pinky tries to cut you off and ambush you. Inky is a bit more complicated. Inky calculates where he should move based on a strange calculation that's based off of Pac-Man's movement as well as Blinky's movement. It looks for the square two tiles in front of Pac-Man and then draws a diagonal line from Blinky's position to that tile. It then doubles the length of that line and aims for whatever square that that line lands on. This is a seemingly strange decision, but it was done in an attempt to make the blue ghost's movement feel super erratic, almost like it's random. Making making it way harder to predict where it's going to choose to go at any time. Then there's Clyde, the orange ghost. Clyde uses his scatter tile to decide where he's going to travel to. If he's further than 8 tiles away from Pac-Man, he will chase Pac-Man, just like Blinky does. If he's closer than 8 tiles, he'll start pathing towards his scatter mode tile in the bottom left corner of the map. Apparently this was done to make it seem like Clyde was just doing his own thing, not really paying much attention to the player at all. These behaviours made Pac-Man's AI revolutionary for the time, making the game seem much more immersive and exciting than other arcade games around it. Just making the pathfinding slightly more complex than Chase the Player made Pac-Man far more exciting than it would have been otherwise. After Pac-Man, a lot of games used similar tricks to make their AI look much more complex than it really was. Games like Dragon Quest allowed the player to tell their party members whether to prioritise damage, healing, or MP conservation. And the AI would have ability usage patterns based on what the player told them to do, making the AI seem very intelligent just from super basic interactions. Sports games like John Madden Football were being released 
released that tried to make certain teams vary in their strategy based on which real-life coach was supposed to be coaching the team. But this gets us into the slightly more modern territory of AI, starting with first-person shooters. The AI in games like Doom and Wolfenstein were exceptionally simple. Enemies would simply shoot at the player whenever they could, barely really moving or reacting in any other way. It took the release of Half-Life in 1998 to make any real moves in FPS AI. Half-Life's AI, for the time, was incredible. Friendly NPCs could be told to stay put or to follow you, and at the very start of the game, you can piss them off by pressing buttons you're not supposed to, or turning off the lights in the rooms they're in. The enemies will call for backup when they see you, and if you deal too much damage to them, they'll run away from you. When they're fleeing, they won't even attack you unless you corner them. They actually seem like they don't want to die, just like a real-life creature might, which is a far cry from the games that were released at a similar time. In those games, the enemies were unrelenting and showed no self-preservation whatsoever. Half-Life changed this, and if you think about it, it was done in a similar way to these Pac-Man ghosts. You don't need to actually make the AI smarter, all you have to do is make the player think that they're smarter. And back in the early 2000s, Bungie proved this when they were working on Halo Combat Evolved. Bungie did an AI test with some of their playtesters. They gave them two versions of the game and asked players which version the players thought had smarter enemies. Everyone unanimously agreed on which one had the smarter AI. But what these players didn't realise is that the AI in the two versions were exactly the same. The only difference between game A and game B was that in one game, the enemies had more health and did more damage, and in the other, they had less health and dealt less damage. Players fighting against enemies that were tougher and hit harder unanimously said that the enemies in this game were smarter. And this is extremely indicative of how modern AI is designed and made. Because in reality, players don't actually care if their AI is smart. They just want it to seem like it's intelligent, whilst also being predictable enough to make meaningful decisions against it in the game. But with that being said, Halo's AI wasn't exactly stupid. It exhibited a lot of really interesting behaviour. Elites would roll out of the way of grenades. Grunts would run away when they were scared. Enemies would flank you, and they'd throw grenades to flush you out of cover. It was nothing that Half-Life hadn't already done three years earlier, but it was a step in the right direction for the industry as a whole. From this point forward, games use a lot of the same tactics that Valve pioneered with Half-Life back in 1998, making enemies and NPCs alike feel much more intelligent. But then Fear was released in 2005. Fear innovated the technology of AI, and it allowed their AI to do lots of context-sensitive things. The AI I did a lot of similar stuff that's seen in Half-Life and Halo. You know, the flanking and the throwing grenades to flush you out and stuff like that. But the way it was handled behind the scenes was much more intelligent. Instead of just doing these things basically at random, the AI could now actually look at the context of the situation and act accordingly. Enemies would wait for you to be distracted before flanking you, so that while you're busy with one enemy, more enemies come from behind you. Enemies could kick over tables to use them as cover, they could open doors, they could crash through windows to get the jump on you, and they could even spot your flashlight in the dark and alert their squad mates to it. AI was getting smarter, and it made a lot of games significantly more difficult because of it. But people realised that games AI becoming much more difficult wasn't necessarily more fun. Sometimes, games having very smart AI would make the enemies much more difficult, but that didn't end up making the game more fun for the player. So people realised that smarter wasn't necessarily better. So instead of innovating on how smart you could make your AI, it instead became much more important to prioritise making the AI actually fun to fight. Because it's one thing making an AI that can kill the player, but it's a whole nother thing to make an AI that is actually fun to fight against. So the AI started to cheat, but not to make themselves stronger. No, they started to make the player stronger. And this is where we get into modern AI. Stuff like Uncharted, where the first bullet fired by enemies after you poke out from cover is guaranteed to miss, to make sure that enemies don't just annihilate you instantly the moment you poke your head up. Enemies in stealth games will say things out loud to make sure that the player knows what they're thinking. Enemies are more predictable, but less intelligent, but they are more fun to play against despite that. They're easier to plan around, and your plans are more likely to work out. The AI will cheat in your favour all the time, and you probably don't even realise it, because although games like Fear were extremely revolutionary, they were also crushingly hard because of how well the AI was able to track you and kill you. Which is cool for some games, sure, but not every game wants this level of difficulty. Not every game benefits from such intelligent AI, so not every game uses it. Modern AI will often use a lot of the same tricks that were revolutionised in the early 2000s, but they'll be dumbed down on purpose, so that they can make your experience as a player more enjoyable. 
That was a brief history of video game AI. I didn't cover everything, I know that for a fact, but I covered most of the influential and famous examples. These revolutionary games pushed AI technology in the industry forward, and the industry is better off for it. But even after all of that innovation, we still get AI that does this. Thanks for watching.